crew. I hope you're still with me. Again, it's Capper from Lantern Light Capital. We were we're on chapter nine here. Uh, Lorenz transformations and chronometric discrepancies and their application uh, to transgalactic propulsion dynamic. Oh no, sorry, sorry. Chapter nine is actually return, return expectations. I get a little a little distracted there sometimes. All right, I like this chapter. Because it deals with one of my favorite little rant points, which is on cost. And you guys, you guys know that all my friends and me, we just hate cap rate, right? Because it's lame. Uh, I have a whole rant on that. Obviously, I know how to use cap rate. I know what it's useful for. But it oftentimes ends up being this backwards calculation that people kind of make up. And, and this yield on cost concept really addresses that. So let's, uh, let's dig into chapter nine. Here, Rob talks about a, a lot of the mantra, knowing your customer, right? And this is basically getting at the investor and the LP and what do different LPs want? Um, different LPs want different things. Some folks, a retail investor might care more about, now I'm a retail investor in some of my deals, they might care more about cash on cash return. And a big institutional investor might not really care if it's a big value add deal. Remember our one, two, three, we've gone over this multiple times. You know, it's like in a big value add storage deal, you might not be cash flowing well during the first couple of years until you hit your steady state and either refi or sale or sale, right? Maybe. Uh, I personally don't care that much about cash flow because I'm not doing these investments for cash flow. That said, we do have deals that we put together that are more cash flow heavy. Uh, other deals, don't cash flow as well in the beginning, because again, they're being built in the beginning. So again, just kind of knowing your customer um, and this concept of knowing the big institutional investor, some of these fund managers. So there's there's this entire genre of investors called fund managers. And these are individuals sometimes that get a bunch of money together and they manage the funds. Now, why would you invest your money with a fund manager? Well, that's the guy's job, right? Like, uh, this guy knows a lot of people in the industry. We've actually are considering doing this at Lantern Light Capital as well, right? I know self storage investors. I know a lot of them. Uh, I could easily deploy, you know, 50, a hundred million in self storage capital. And I know these folks. I know the good folks. I've been in on the deals with the good folks and the bad folks. I know some of them too that are kind of crummy. Um, and I wouldn't, as a fund manager, go in uh, in on deals with them, right? And so that's what a fund manager does. They say, you know, I know all these people in this industry, or it might not even be industry specific, but it may well be, and give me your money, I'll help invest it, and I'll do all this work and find these good investments. That's a fund manager. The fund manager has to take their fees. So some of these funds might have a very high target IRR uh, because of the double promote nature of their setup. Remember, promote is just the fees and how much uh, that fund manager makes. Uh, the 2 and 20 is what they kind of, you'll often hear to, this is getting a little bit, no, actually, it's nice to know, 2 and 20, a 2% fee, so this guy says, okay, or like us, right, Lantern Light Capital, we're going to set up the, uh, our glowing light, let's brand it, I love our branding, glowing light storage fund, okay, so we're going to raise a mil 100 million, let me know if you want in on this. Glad to glad to deploy the Glowing Light Storage Fund. I just came up with that right now, by the way. And you know our logo, right? The Lantern Light logo. You see that's a little shining, shining light. Oh, I'm sorry. Shout out to Jean-Luc Laub, who is our um, très bien uh, designer, who designed the logo. This is a Jean-Luc. This is a JLL. He is a uh, pretty renowned high-end designer. We splurged on the logo. I had to. I've known John Luke for a long time now. But um, so, anyways, the funds they'll typically do a two percent uh, asset management fee, and then they get twenty percent of the returns um, of the profit. 
So they're a double promote setup. So they might demand a higher IRR. Alternatively, maybe the fund manager said, hey, uh, my thing with funds is I go out and we just buy stabilized assets. That's the fund, the stable asset fund. Okay. You know, it's the fund strategy. So some funds might not be interested in uh, high IRR. That's a little bit more risky. Uh, some people might care more about IRR or cash on cash. We talked about that, right? Um, of note, you might see these things thrown around. Ooh, the gross IRR. Let's see, net. IRR. The gross IRR is like, you know, 25 projected. Remember, these are always still projected, right? Um, that was that intro video where I say, yeah, you can still lose money in all this. And a big part of setting up these investments is, <laughs> is not promising returns. You can always lose money. And I mean, geez, uh, e even, oh, well, I say it should go without being said. I keep having to cage that because it's, it's important to say these things, but, um, even the preferred return of a standard LP, the common equity LP, that you know, 8% preferred return, we're not talking about um, pref equity, we're talking about standard common uh, equity preferred returns. That's not like guaranteed somehow, like nothing is guaranteed, right? Um, it's just that you're guaranteed to get paid that before me as a GP before I get paid my returns. I still get my fees though. Um, Again, transparency. Uh, gross IRR might be 25%. The net IRR might be 15 What is net IRR? Net IRR is the IRR, the internal rate of return, basically your um, time value of money adjusted returns after the GP promote. So this is really what you care about. I guess gross IRR um, could be useful, or it is useful, I shouldn't say, I guess. It's useful to compare gross versus net. Gross, basically saying, you know, how it gives you some cushion, I guess, if there's a very high gross IRR, if the deal is underwritten well. All of this is assuming good underwriting. Um, if the deal is underwritten well and the, you're dealing with an established operator, the gross IRR is very high. Uh, say the gross IRR is, you know, again, say 30 and the net is 13. Well, you know, it also speaks towards the fees right? The fees and the promote, because that, that gap there is uh, how much the, um, how much the GP is taking from the deal. So it speaks towards the fees and it speaks towards how high the top end of the deal is, which, uh, I guess theoretically it would be nice to have a very high top end. It gives you some wiggle room. Like for example, I would, if I was a investor and all I cared about was like low, 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 low risk and mid tier returns, I'd be okay setting like a 10%. I'd be like a pref equity investor. I'd be okay, again, assuming proper underwriting, but let's say your net IRR is 10% and your gross is like a hundred percent, you know, I'm just making this very, very high, right? Well, that means, well, one, the GPs are getting a big chunk of this deal, but there's a lot of headroom, assuming proper underwriting, you know, assuming the guy's not making this up is what I mean when I say assuming proper underwriting. There's a lot of headroom, if you will, to hit your net kind of thing. All right. So uh, some examples, let's take a new property, right? Brand new, beautiful uh, storage facility. There's our little, well, that's not how storage facilities look. Let's use our eraser. I love our eraser. All right, there we go. Beautiful. We'll do outdoor drive up, you know, just keep it simple. A nice storage facility. It's got steady cash flow. It was built two years ago. It's fully occupied now. You might have an IRR of 13. All right. Versus an older, higher risk, kind of dilapidated, broken door. You know, those doors definitely need repaired and it needs leased up. Uh, that might have a targeted higher IRR, right? So you're saying as an investor, because, and again, how is IRR calculated as well? Remember, we're, when we say IRR, you really should be talking about net IRR as an investor. Um, so you can increase your net IRR by having the GP give you better terms, right? Uh, a better uh, promote, 
uh, instead of 70-30, they might you know give you 80-20. And so you can get a better IRR just from siphoning off some of that promote, uh, which again, promote is how much the uh, GP makes. Now, IRR hurdles, remember that. We talked about that concept where after you hit an IRR of say, 13 percent from there uh, then it goes from 70 30 and this is again the GP to after an IRR of 13 it goes to like 60 40 or 50 50 and the GP starts to make you know a lot more and just another little concept there now let's get into uh, let's get into yield on cost um, I like yield on cost. I think it's very useful. And it it marries up nicely to the concept of, of the cap rate, which you guys know how I feel about cap rate. But let's look at the yield on cost. Okay, so yield, YOC, YOC equals stabilized NOI over total cost. Um, what is this telling us? So this stabilized NOI and what was the, uh, what was the cap rate? It's just NOI over NOI over, I know, purchase price, sale price, value, this vague term, NOI, sorry, Ooh, my eraser, don't forget it, there, the cap rate. It's a very similar type formula, right? Hmm, interesting. Well, but let's look. Normally, how do you talk about a cap rate? They'll say, <clears throat> let me read this sentence here, actually, before I, I even uh, go into this. Yield on costs, this is right from Rob's book, uh, Structuring and Raising Debt and Equity for Real Estate by the book. It's an amazing book. Yield on cost, more specifically, untended stabilized yield on cost, is a pure form of valuation because it cannot be manipulated by growth factors, financing, or an exit cap. Hmm, exit cap. Okay. What the heck is that exit cap? Wait a minute. The cap rate, the value, this is that exit you're assuming. Here's how people do the val, here's how you would target the IRR at, val at exit, or sorry, here, part of calculating the IRR is the sale price, right? Because remember your two exits are your cash flowing and then you sell the place. So how do you calculate or estimate in the pro forma the sale price? Well, the sale price equals, sale price is calculated, aka the value is calculated using the cap rate. So the sale price, so let's see, sale price, we'll divide, we'll multiply, we'll do some basic math here. Uh -huh. We'll do cap rate times price equals the NOI. And then, so to do, we're just doing basic solving here. Cap rate times price is that. And then we'll cap rate times price, uh, divide by cap rate. Move cap rate over there, price equals NOI over cap rate. Cap rate. That's how you determine price. Wait a minute. That's just a formula. NOI is legit at the time of sale. That you know the real number. Well, you're still predicting it because it's pro forma. But then this is what you can fudge. Well, you say, I think I'm going to get a cap rate of like 7% 7 7 cap rate at the sale. I don't know. I think it's going to be more of an eight. Actually, I think I can get a 4% cap and that causes the price to fluctuate wildly. So it's made up TLDR. You're using industry kind of standard, if you will, what you suspect the cap rate to be to calculate the exit sale price, but it's just made up. What is, how do you really determine exit sale price? There's only one way. And I say this kind of tongue in cheek, but there's only one way. It's the day of sale when someone hands you a check. That's the exit sale price. 
It doesn't matter what the cap rate is for the facility next door that was sold yesterday. The exit sales price is what the guy is willing to buy it for. And so all this is kind of made up. So what does yield on cost try to give you instead of this kind of made up thing where you can manipulate the cap rate? Remember, that's where it says it cannot be um, manipulated by financing or exit cap rate. And of course, cap rate tries to control for financing issues. That's the whole point of it. Uh, that's why it uses the NOI instead of cash flow, I should say. Um, we'll talk about that later, but... What does the yield on cost do? It says, what's the stable NOI? Okay, sure. That's the same as your cap rate over the total cost. The total actual cost to, to buy, build, or whatever the facility. So it's a more true form of cap rate. It's a, it's a way of saying, what is the cap rate based on your actual current cost. But then, of course, there is this future prediction into it. You are still, it's still a pro forma, a forward-looking number in the fact that this is a future, oh God, a future, where did our thing go? Okay. Got it. A future number. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. How many, this is what we've done so far. There's where baby Jordan drew a picture of me. Wow. What good handwriting. Okay. Are we there yet? Chapter six. How many chapters have I done? Oh my God. Look at this. Is that a good enough review for you guys? So point is, as I continue to scroll, point is that real investors care about the YOC, the YOC. Nobody actually calls it the YOC, but the yield on cost. Um, of note, looking at that yield on cost to cap rate spread uh, is a, a valuable tool in itself because what it what it basically says is the true value created by the investment. So YOC versus cap rate spread is basically saying by investing and bringing value to this facility. Because the only difference between the YOC and the cap rate is what your cap rate, aka what you think you can sell it for, the, the sale cap, versus what you're actually kind of paying for it, if you will, the paying for cap rate. That spread between the YOC, the yield on cost, and the cap rate tells you the value created in the investment. How much value you created by doing the investment, the true value created because in YOC in the yield on cost it's using the total cost as opposed to the total sales price so you could just buy a fully 100% stabilized asset at the current market cap rate and in that case the yield on and don't bring any value to it nothing you just hold the property and in that case the yield on cost would equal the cap rate so that's yield on cost, a very useful term, often more useful than a cap rate. Again, it, the point is not to just know these definitions and rattle off the uh, algebraic equation. No, it's to understand the point of these things. And hopefully if you let these terms wash over you and let this lecture wash over your body, you will slowly get a feel for what these things are. Um, last little comment in this chapter nine, Rob goes in and talks about risk adjusted returns. So risk adjusted, I'm like sweating a little bit here, returns, it's like a fiery episode. Um, what he goes on to say is the typical kind of way of putting it is that as risk goes up, reward goes up like okay this is a higher risk type facility i want a higher irr but that's not necessarily true higher returns are not guaranteed with higher risk right and this gets into knowing your customer aka understanding what your investors want and what type of things they want to invest in and doing what's right you can uh, target these higher IRRs by 
changing the percentage ownership, sorry, by changing the promote, how much, you know, you get as a GP, and you can target higher IRRs for the LPs. Um, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee. It doesn't, just because you put a higher IRR doesn't mean that that return is guaranteed. So a investment may be riskier, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get more, uh, a higher IRR. Uh, and that is one of these things that kind of goes without being said, but it's nice to say it as well, to hear that, oh, yeah, I guess that, you know, that makes sense. Uh, and then some investors are looking for for simple cash flow, right? So if you're a first time GP, instead of targeting some higher risk, you know, deal where it's not going to cash flow, maybe you just do a nice little base hit, nice little solid, you know, good cash on cash, cash flow, cash flow, day one. And you just make your investors real happy versus you know, some of the deals that we like to do, uh, they take one, remember this whole thing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the cell storage deals, they, a ground up deal is not going to cash flow. Well, if at all, in year one, maybe year two, that's where you put the interest only. With these loans, we negotiate for interest only, period. So we're not, so our cash flow is a little better in the beginning. Um, point is, Know your deal. Talk about your deal. Know your investor. Talk to your investor and know what they want. And if everybody's on the same page and everything's fine, you fully discuss the deal, you fully understand it from top to bottom. That's what's important. All right, guys, hopefully this was a good one. Uh, hopefully you learned a little bit. You know you can reach out to me anytime. It's Jordan at Lantern Light Cap. That's Lantern Light C-A-P dot com. Or call me directly, text me. Uh, I'd prefer, but call me too. Call me anytime. 484-228-1242. That's my personal business cell. That's on me 24-7. Wishing you all the very best. God bless.